animals that eat them are mostly eating an opportunistic way. And if they were to evolve a dependency on <laughs> mushrooms or a particular kind, since we only pick you know, a dozen kinds or so commonly, they would not be able to leave many offspring because a year would come when there weren't mushrooms around and they'd be gone. They discard the so the whole idea that, that uh, the animals need them, they, they eat them definitely, and they're out there all the time, unlike us. So I don't really worry about that one either. Boy, this is, I'm squeezing this thing for some reason. <laughs> Hard to read, yeah, worked up. Well, I'm just so tired of it. I'm not hungry, I hate one person thinks that. But it's just over and over again. It's like, and, and people who should know better. Really. They love them. Yeah, absolutely. They love them. And I, I'll often find one crossing the driveway, and I'll pick it up and take it to them. <laughs> <laughs> they have special uh, so-called fungus detectors on their, their eye stalks there. Okay, something else about this, uh, this is Simon Egwood. So everybody refers to that study. And then they make up stuff, too. Like they, they say, well, you should carry your mushrooms in a net bag so the spores will spread. Or you should carry them in a basket, etc. That may be, but none of that's been proved at all. That's, those are people's ideas. I honestly, I like the plastic bag and the hip pocket kind of thing like this. I don't like to carry around a big basket, because I do sometimes. Anyway. Um, people are very concerned about being morally correct about mushroom gathering. And that's a big difference between here where even with the increased popularity, there's not that many mushroom gatherers, as opposed to somebody or mushroom hunters in uh, Yunnan, China, or in Zimbabwe, or in Poland, Mexico. They're just gathering the mushrooms. <laughs> and there's still lots of mushrooms there. <coughs> So this guy, Egley, did another study that actually very few people know of it, but, but, this, this, but, 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 but you could Google it. It was a study where they, they did a very severe thinning of a forest in Switzerland. Now, they took very careful readings of all the mushrooms there over several years before they did the thinning and then after. And what they found is immediately, in their case, immediately, starting the next year and then subsequently, there was a dramatic jump in both the numbers of mushrooms and the diversity. Now that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that you can just thin forest and that will happen. It just means in their case it happened. But there's also studies of other thinning forests that showed a decrease. And I'm talking about mycorrhizal mushrooms, not, not all the kinds that grow on the wood that, that you know, would, would presumably grow after they got thinned. Just the mycorrhizal mushrooms. But that's not really the message of it. The message of it is this. These people spent almost 30 years picking every mushroom in these areas and trying to see whether they could make a difference. And they couldn't. And then they thinned the forest. And the next year, they made a huge difference by doing that. In their case, it benefited the mushrooms. Obviously, in other cases, 
it didn't, but the point is that habitat is way, way more important to mushrooms than being overly concerned about how many spores you're going to escape and all that stuff. So, in teaching here, and this is a reason I, I stopped too, I started getting these people that read this book called Braiding Sweetgrass, where it's got the, the rules to ethical foraging, and they let's take no more than 10% of the bottom of them, etc. Mostly the author was actually talking about plants. And even then, I don't like it because it's a very much an oversimplification. There's some plants that you, you can cut them and pick them to no end, and they still come back. And there's others that are very vulnerable. So that this whole 10% rule, and then I'm so ethical because I only pick 10%. You, you <laughs> pick 22%. I just, I just don't go there. So. Um, okay, next page. Okay. Mm, myths around scarcity popularity. So now I'm going to ask this, to see just four pictures about stuff I've, I've covered here. study in Switzerland. One thing about the study, it was like incredible with meticulous. I mean, just think of it. For 27 years, you and your, your team are out there gathering mushrooms, gathering every mushroom, and they're charting, weighing, counting, all that stuff. Anyway, but for me, the most interesting statement, because none of what they found surprised me, but the thing that was remarkable is the last paragraph of the study in which they say, although we, we found to our, our surprise that mushroom picking does not impair future harvests, we recommend prohibiting it. Because by doing that, we're teaching people that nature is fragile and therefore needs to be protected. So, this is an issue I have with some scientists, so many don't um, go that way, but some scientists who take it upon themselves to go way beyond their data, and they're echoing, and they're echoing this idea, which is very much a, a control people. It comes from a place of controlling people, and you do that by teaching them something that Instead of teaching them to differentiate between like trees and mushrooms, etc., you're teaching them that nature is fragile, therefore we shouldn't gather anything. Um, another thing that I forgot to mention about that study that they were only looking at mushrooms growing on the ground, actually, mostly growing in moss. Um, there is a, a difference in mushrooms growing on trees. Sometimes the, there's these mushrooms co called conchs that instead of making a new mushroom every year, they just keep adding layers to the existing mushroom. They can get quite huge that way. You can sometimes estimate their age by counting the layers. All right. So that's medicine. Now, some conchs are annuals like Rishi, but many of them are not. And 
when you're picking the card, you're not just removing a mushroom that represents several days of growth, like a, a chemo leaf, or several weeks of growth, like a chanterelle. You're removing a mushroom that actually represents years of growth. And I think that's a little bit different. You're still not killing the organism that's in the tree, but you're forcing it to make a new mushroom. And so there is a difference between uh, taking something that represents days of growth versus years. So what I would say with them is simply that, not that you should never pick cons, but just think twice about it, how much you really want or quote, need, need, there's that word, need to pick it. Second study that they did, okay? It's called Is Forest Mushroom Productivity Driven by Tree Growth? So that was the results of a thinning experiment. Again, you can Google it just anyway. Okay, next. Okay, then you you also get here. Japan declined precipitously following the switch from a, a charcoal-driven economy to a fossil fuel economy. So the habitat gradually changed. People used to take all these hardwoods out and use them for charcoal. And that favored the growth of Matsutake. Matsu is pine and take is mushroom. So pine mushroom. And once the practice stopped, then the, the Matsutake went down. So Matsutake enhancement there, though, involves trying to replicate the things that the Uters did years ago, which favored Matsutake. So one of the things that they did was, not during Matsutake season, but during the off season, maybe like the spring they would rake back all the needles. They used the pine needles for their animal. So that they would rake back all the pine needles from the forest. And that actually favored Matsutake. It decreased competing bacteria. And and yet you hear it here. You hear only, oh don't, don't rake, you know, or if you make a hole to take the mushroom, cover it up as those squirrels did that, but they don't, actually. <laughs> uh, so, again, I'm not trying to say that anything's okay. I'm just saying that people really tend to latch onto these, these ideas that you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do this, but there's actually not all that much data. And the same thing with trampling. That's the opposite effect. Raking aerates the soil. Trampling compacts it. And obviously, if a lot of people go into one area and trample it, like a trail, not only will mushrooms not grow that much right on the trail, but a lot of you know, the plants also don't grow there. So when something gets really hard packed, not much grows there. But any time a trail is created through the woods, it creates two edges. And edges are a great habitat for mushrooms. Now, next. OK, this just touches on a couple countries here. Okay, Czech Republic, Poland, OK. 
Oh, oh yeah. So <laughs> in Poland, they did a survey where almost 50% of people said that mushroom hunting was a favorite pastime, a favorite activity. 50%, almost. So what do you think the percentage is here? <laughs> it's really low. Even with all the people, it seems like a lot of people out there, if you go to one of the two legal areas nearby to Gavik, because a lot of people go there, but it's actually not that many. Okay, a different question was asked in the Czech Republic. They asked, uh, have you been mushroom hunting this year? One survey, 70%. Another survey, 90%. It's not the same question, but there's still mushroom hunters. That's why I put plus there, because it, it was a different question, but there, there's undoubtedly more than 50, way more than actually have been mushroom hunting that year. Okay, the populations of Poland and California are very similar. California is a little bigger, but there's, of course, a lot of desert, too. Uh, the Czech Republic is a lot smaller and it has a lot of people. So, when people complain, as they do, about <laughs> the woods being too crowded with mushroom hires and the woods getting, uh, you know, getting trashed and everything, largely that's a function of. Uh, People naturally want to be legal, and they have very few choices of where they can go. So, one way that you can deal with this, I mean, I don't think anytime soon that regulations here are going to change. You can go to the Sierras and gather there pretty much anywhere, uh, except the national parks. But there's a lot of ground you can. But that's a lot of driving. Mushroom money, one of the really beautiful things about mushroom money for me is that I can just go nearby. It, it can be a green activity, but driving like three hours or more go mushroom hunting for two hours and then driving back, it's no longer a green activity. So one way that, that you can deal with that is simply to not confine yourself to the five or six mushrooms that everybody picks. Learn some more mushrooms. There's an incredible array really good edible mushrooms. And you can do that just by studying up and uh, I actually used to offer a class called Beyond Poutine. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of good mushrooms that people, most people don't pick. And so you can't go to areas that have a lot of people mushrooms. Then there's a, a myth about uh, say about three or four years ago, and now it's not so much. But they, there's a myth that that you uh, you shouldn't use common names for mushrooms. You know, that, that you should use scientific names because they're Universal. Well, when somebody says they're universal, I know that they haven't traveled much. <laughs> oh my God. I went to Yunnan, China uh, almost 20 years in a row during the summertime. Incredible place for mushrooms, and everybody picked mushrooms. Never heard a single scientific name ever used. Same with, with Japan, with Mexico, with African countries like Zambia, 
Zimbabwe, Eastern Europe, Catalonia, etc. So, yes, there is an educated elite, especially ones who study mushrooms and use scientific names. And so, of course, if you know that you can use them for them, but it really isn't something that you need to do because there's also this thing called Google. And as long as the common name, the, the big complaint is, well, there is one common name applied to several mushrooms, several different mushrooms, and many different common names applied to the same mushroom. Well, that's true, and it's actually true for scientific names also. But anyway, never mind that. <laughs> um, they, if the common name on Google leads you to the mushroom that matches you know, what you're talking about, that's the standard. Then it's a useful common name. It doesn't matter that there's other common names that also go there. It's like the English language has many, many words for idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Many of them, for some reason, start with D. <laughs> Dunderhead, dimwit, uh, doofus, etc. I think that's incredible. Why should we only have one word to describe idiot? How boring the world would that be? <laughs> so I find it really interesting that one mushroom can have different names in different regions. And so long as it's on Google, you can get to the mushroom that you're talking about. And you may discover that it has one scientific name or that the name has changed about seven times in seven years. <laughs> that happens also. OK, now. I'm going to talk about the last thing here, would be myths around cooking mushrooms. Okay. I want to read uh, a couple things here. That's uh, kind of entertaining. So, if you don't know, the Anglo tradition is very mushroom phobic. As opposed to, to traditions like from Eastern Europe, from Italy, from Japan, China, etc. So, just to give you a sense of how how deep and how bizarre this goes, here's a, a couple of passages. The first one from uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, okay, Sherlock Holmes author. He's describing a landscape. And you have to understand, for this to be successful, his readers, most of them, have to share the same revulsion mushroom that he has. Okay, so he says, A sickly autumn shone upon the land. Wet and rotten leaves reeked and festered under the foul haze. The fields were spotted with monstrous fungi of a size and color never matched before. <laughs> Scarlet and mauve and liver and black. It was as though the sick earth had burst into foul pustules. <laughs> God. <laughs> I mean, this is serious. <laughs> Can you imagine a Russian going into you know, the woods and seeing all of the mushrooms and thinking that the earth has burst into They'd be cutting right below. <laughs> okay. And then D. H. Lawrence, and he says, How beastly the bourgeois is, especially the male of the species. Nicely groomed, like a mushroom, standing there so sleek and erect and pliable, and like a fungus living on the remains of bygone life, sucking his life out of the dead leaves of greater life than his own. And even so, he 
He's stale. He's been there too long. Touch him and you'll find he's all gone inside, just like an old mushroom, all wormy inside and hollow mm -hmm. under a smooth skin and an upright appearance, mm -hmm. full of seething, wormy, hollow feelings, rather nasty, how beastly the bourgeois is. Standing in their thousands, these appearances in damp England, what a pity they can't all be kicked over like sickening toadstools <laughs> and let them melt back swiftly into the soil of England. Yeah. So that's kind of what we um, inherited from England. And for all the English speaking and colonized countries, it's like that. Um, and a short one for Emily Dickinson. Very short. Had nature any outcast face, could she a son come down? Had nature an Iscaria, that mushroom is him. <laughs> and you can contrast that with, uh, say, a famous, uh, oh, Japanese haiku. Very short. It goes, I forgot falling off the horse with the happiness of finding mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, even nowadays, with a lot of people coming into mushroom and not sharing those, that antipathy, we still carry it in us. And we, it's important, I think, to realize that we still come from a mushroom poor tradition. And in the kitchen, like cooking the mushrooms, uh, we are a, a, the last major English cookbook to have a mushroom, have a recipe for boiled mushrooms was the accomplished cook in the 1600s. <laughs> mushrooms and water. In our culture, they don't mix. But what's interesting in mushroom-loving cultures, they do. They boil them routinely in Eastern Europe, in Russia, in Yunnan, in Japan, Africa, Mexico. Not always, but it's not something that they avoid doing. And yet people here still have all kinds of anxiety about, well, I shouldn't wash the mushroom. I should wipe it off with a damp cloth. Don't wash it. I know a commercial picker named Randex, who went, uh, I think he's from San Luis Obispo. He picked chanterelles. He would gather them, he'd take them home, and they got pictures of them, hose them off. Okay? So not only are they nice and clean, or not completely clean, but mostly clean, but they're also heavier. And then he would drive them down drive them down to Los Angeles. In those days, a really famous restaurant there was Spargo's in Hollywood. Uh, he would, as much as sellers do, he'd go in the back door into the kitchen, and one day, he walked in with the, the, the chanterelles, and the head chef was there. And he said, wow, chanterelles. Lovely, lovely. He gave him the caps and turned to his kitchen staff and said, now, the chanterelles have a very delicate flavor, so I don't want you to wash them all. <laughs> this is after they've been in the rain for two or three weeks or more, and after Brandex hose them off, and but they're so delicate. <laughs> so don't be afraid of water. In fact, in my little book, I talk about a dry saute. Dry saute, you put the mushrooms in with chanterelles and let them generate their own water, no oil. You can cover the pan and uncover it. After the water boils away, then you add some fat. But since then, my number one way to cook mushrooms is the opposite. It's a wet saute. I call it that. Anyway, what saute is where 
you put the mushrooms in the skillet and you add some water. Mm -hmm. One big advantage of this is I think a lot of mushroom poisoning is coming from mushrooms that's not being cooked enough. So by doing that, it's helping to evenly cook them all the way to brew. And then once the kind of broth develops, and you should taste the broth too. So taste it to see, because I, I learned a lot from doing that. I just harvested a whole bunch of them. Bluets. And uh, bluets are a little bit watery, but you cook them down, they have great texture, and the broth that they give off is just amazing. It's, mm -hmm. it's really kind of like, well, it reminds me of red meat, but I don't eat red meat that much, so I don't know. Uh, so you can boil mushrooms. A very popular thing in China is hot pocket mushrooms. In Japan, nabe, same thing basically, with mushrooms. So that doesn't mean that you always have to boil it, but it's really interesting that we, coming from a mushroom-deprived culture, would take the word of our own chefs that say, don't use water, rather than these countries where mushroom drink is a long tradition. I'll read you something else real quick here that's, uh, Swedish mycologist who wound up living in Thailand and writing a book about Thai vegetables. It's actually a pretty decent book, but there's this incredible passage here where, where <coughs> let me back up and say that there's a famous Famous in my mind. A famous saying this, this uh, anthropologist named uh, Clara Levi Strauss said something must be good to think before it is good to eat. And basically, what he's saying is a lot of what we like to eat is just what we're used to, it's good in our minds. And so we like to that's why Chinese love mushroom hot pot and Americans don't. Okay, so this is from that book. He's talking about this belief that actually doesn't go here. It's not Cochin, it's a different one. But anyway, he says, Asian mushroom recipes are generally for watery soups where the taste is quite bland. Frying Asian mushrooms and then extracting the flavors with cream, as in Europe, will provide a full-bodied gastronomic experience. <laughs> this mushroom should be cooked in the same way as the king believed, i.e. sliced and then fried in butter, and then cooked with cream when the water is gone. Sort of with pasta. If you cook it in the Asian way, boiling it in a soup, you will find that eating it is like listening to Mozart with cotton in your ears. <laughs> wow. So, a totally gratuitous insult, but this is somebody who's really intelligent. He's, you know, PhD, and all that, but he can't see beyond his own culture. In Sweden, yeah, the mushrooms are cooked in cream. And he loves them that way. Great. So if he had just said, well, if you're from Europe, you may want to, to cook them in some cream. Nothing wrong with that. But instead, he makes this, what he thinks is this objective statement that, well, they're going to be totally bland if you have them in soup. I have mushrooms in soups all the time. Thailand, mm -hmm. Laos, Cambodia, <coughs> Japan. I love them. I'm almost done now. <laughs>
I'll conclude with you simply by saying that the uh, the last bit is probably the biggest myth of all. And here you can show there's that. Uh, let's see the last one. Yeah. Oh, this was just from Yunnan, China. There's a sign there. Can you imagine a forest here that welcomes people yeah. with a sign like this that lists all the mushrooms you can find there? <laughs> they come on in, or they're proud of it. <laughs> okay. So, a typical fungus mushroom t shirt. Next. <laughs> <laughs> So what I notice about here, we tend to fetishize mushrooms. I don't mean it sexually or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Just that we objectify them, exalt them. And if you look at our popular culture of you know, posters and shirts and everything else, it's mushroom after mushroom after mushroom. It's the object of that. And I think that's the biggest Myth of all. Because, uh, next one. This is a poster from Japan. Very modest art. But this poster here shows a whole different thing. It's an emphasis on relationships. Relationships that people have uh, with each other, with the mushrooms, with the trees, etc. Next. And I'm going to conclude by reading something about this here. So these are tricky tricks. Now, you can hear all about medicinal properties of tricky tricks. I try not to get into uh, discussions about medicinal tricks because there's so much Including the turkey tail, which uh, Paul Stamets lectures upon and tells you the story of how the turkey tail saved his mother from cancer. He also mentions, but not very, I mean, he's careful to uh, mention it, but just sort of in passing that his mother had uh, also, also treated with naturally occurring in the YouTube. And also Perceptin, which is a, it's not chemo, it's a targeted therapy toward a particular cancer of the positive that the mother had. And it, it has a very high success rate. Okay, so she took those and then also turkey tails that Paul supplied. And Paul credits of recovery to the tricky test. That's fine. I mean, he believes it, right? Mushroom will save the world, right? So that's fine. But lost in it is all the people who just, since he's emphasizing the tricky tales, that's what they take away, that the tricky tales saved his mom. It's not really clear what actually he did. It could have been the perception, the taxol, the tricky tales, the belief in tricky all those things could have been really crucial, but only one of them comes out of it. It's objectified as tricky tales. So I'm going to conclude by reading you something short that I, I wrote on this theme. Thank you.
details are one of the most promising medicinal mushrooms. They haven't been shown to be anti-cancer, as some people claim, but they do contain compounds like PSK that appear to be helpful to cancer patients immune systems in dealing with the adverse effects of chemotherapy or radiation. FDA approved clinical trials are ongoing. However, I said this, we tend to avoid discussions of them because there's so much hype involved. There is a tendency to fetishize certain mushrooms and hail them as magic bullets. But I think the most powerful therapeutic value of wild mushrooms doesn't come in a bottle or bag. It lies in the search for them. <laughs> I don't think meaning is something that exists out there, like a mushroom, waiting to be found. Meaning is something we create through our passion, our ambition, our curiosity, our effort, and above all, by forming and developing relationships. The search for mushrooms has enabled me to form many deep and abiding and dynamic relationships with nature, with people, with places, with bodies of knowledge, with histories, with things. The search for mushrooms has brought me insight, beauty, excitement, joy, compassion, delicious meals, and friendship. As our civilization moves farther and away from our ancient lifestyles, there's a growing body of research suggesting that contact with the natural world, be it in wilderness, garden, vacant lot, or city park, is beneficial to our health, boosting endorphin and dopamine levels, and reducing stress. I don't have immune system issues that I know of, so I don't use turkey tails for that purpose. But I do cook turkey tails occasionally to make an infused pumpkin. It's so easy to do. Just boil them in the water for 45 minutes to an hour or longer to make a soup base. It never feels like a chore. I find the process calming and stress reducing. It keeps me in the present, not worrying about the future or what others are up to or all the ways I might be missing out. <coughs> and sipping from my little cup of turkey tail creates a second infusion, infusing me with immense gratitude for the small treasures and pleasures of life. Thank you.